Good evening. It's good to see everyone here tonight. We want to welcome everyone here, not only our members, but also uh, our visitors. Uh, as Stephen mentioned a moment ago, I don't see very many, if any. Uh, but if you are here, uh, we want to welcome you back to our next service, uh, which will be this Wednesday at 7 o'clock for our midweek Bible study. Uh, also, as uh, Brother Stephen mentioned a moment ago, uh, I will be traveling to Costa Rica, and the reason why I bring that up is because many of you have inquired, uh, inquired about that, and many of you have been so interested and, and excited for me, and I just wanted to say thank you for that. Uh, this congregation never fails to uh, amaze me in the realm of encouragement, and so I thank you for your excitement for me and for also your prayers as well. This evening, we want to uh, speak about a lesson concerning the work of the church. Uh, many of the songs that we sung a moment ago pertain to that idea. I appreciate the uh, verse that was read for us a moment ago in Matthew chapter 7, verses uh, 24 through 27. Because remember what we see there, Jesus brings up the wise and the foolish builder. And remember, Jesus says that those who hear his word and do it, he likens to a wise man who builds his house upon the rock. And he says that this wise man whose house is built upon the rock, that whenever the rains fall and whenever the floods come and when the winds beat against that house, that house will not fall because it is founded upon the rock. But then Jesus also mentions the foolish builder. And he likens him to one who hears the words of Christ but does not do them. He is foolish because he is one who builds his house upon the sand, not a stable foundation. And we see there that whenever the rains fell and the floods came and the winds beat against that house, that house fell. And Jesus says, great was the fall of that house. Now, we could go a step further with uh, these two comparisons. We could uh, go a step further with the wise builder, and we could perhaps compare him to the church. We do know that the church is indeed built upon a rock. Remember, we read in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church. Well, what rock is that? Well, it was that confession that Peter made there, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the foundation upon which the church is built. And that is not a foundation that will be moved at all. But then we could also compare the foolish builder perhaps to the world. The philosophies and the teachings and the ways and the works of this world, they are shifting and changing constantly just like the sands that the foolish man built his house upon. And really how true that is, when you think about our world today, when you think about the things that are accepted in our society, many of the things that we see accepted today would not have been as accepted or tolerated many years ago. The simple fact is things have changed. And that is the simple truth. We live in a challenging world because things do change and they change constantly. This world changes. Mindsets change. People can change. Governments change. Technology changes. Everything is constantly shifting and, and phasing like the sands that that man built his house upon. In fact, when you think about the mindset that this world has adopted, it is now a mindset that accepts immorality. Now, sure, the world, uh, biblically speaking, has always accepted this, but nonetheless, again, as we mentioned, mindsets change. A lot of the things we see today would not have been as tolerated many years ago. We now see mindsets that accept such things as wild living and rebellion, love of evil and hatred of good, along with sexually immoral things, and the list goes on and on. Now, not only is that sad, but it's even more sad because many churches have gone the way of the world too. They have, in fact, stopped being the church. They have uprooted themselves from the rock, and they have planted themselves on the sand. And they are just as, as shifty and changing like the rest of the world. That's not how it should be. That's not how it should be at all. The church should be founded upon the rock which does not change whatsoever. Now, fortunately, there are many churches who have not separated themselves from the truth. They've not severed themselves from the truth. We are not like the church at Sardis who was dead, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 2. We are alive because our works are rooted in obedience. 
But again, the world's philosophies, its ways, its works, they are shifting and changing all the time. Again, like the sand that the foolish man built his house upon. The church, however, the church is built upon the rock, and that is something that will never change. It is rooted upon that confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. It comes from obeying the Word of God, which does not change. And my friends, with that in mind, we must understand that the church, as long as it follows the Word of God, will always, always be the same. Well, this evening we want to, again, we want to, to speak to the works of the church. These works that the church is to be a part of are things that have never changed. As we've already alluded to, the world is constantly changing things, uh, shift and change all the time. But one thing we can be assured of is that the church does not. It is like a, a beacon. It is like a lighthouse. It is a rock that is firm and secure. In fact, remember in Daniel chapter 2, remember when Nebuchadnezzar had his dream. He, he dreamed of a, a, a statue. And many different parts, many different metals in that statue represented uh, the different kingdoms that would come in the future. But then we see there the kingdom that was not made with hands. It was a rock that struck that idol, and it broke apart. And that rock became a mountain, and it was not to be moved. That is like what the church is. The church is founded upon a rock. It is a mountain that cannot be moved, even though our world is constantly moving and changing. And so again, the works of the church are the same as they've always been since Acts chapter 2. And that's what we want to notice tonight. Now again, keep in mind there are many things we could perhaps say in regards to the works of the church. But we do want to mention just a few things in reference to some of the main ideas as to the work that we are involved in. The work that we have put our hand to, that we should not look back. And so consider with me a few things that we should uh, notice when it comes to the work of the church. I have for you just three points this evening. Consider with me number one. The work of the church or the function of the body is to obey the head. Is to obey the head. Now we are approaching our study from the standpoint of the church being the body of Christ. And the scriptures have made it very clear that that is exactly the case. In Colossians uh, chapter 1 and verse 24, the Bible says there that His body is the church. It does not get much clearer or plainer than that. The Bible also tells us that Christ is the head of the body. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18 says, and He is the head of the body, the church. As it's uh, been said before, you'd have to have someone help you misunderstand that. The Bible is very clear, very plain, and very straightforward about that fact that the church is the body and Christ is the head of that body. Now, when we think about the headship of Christ, what does that imply? Well, the headship of Christ implies authority. He is the head, meaning we submit to Him in all things. Consider with me a few passages. We could perhaps consider the words of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23. The Bible says there that as the husband is head of the wife, so also Christ is head of the church. Also, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22, the Bible says that He gave Him to be head over all things to the church. We submit to Him in all things. Also, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 24, the Bible says that the church is subject to Christ. Again, this is the first and foremost work of Christ's church, to obey the head. In fact, it all starts there. If we don't first understand this a very important point, that our first and foremost work is to obey Christ in all things, then everything else will be undone. How can we be faithful to God in anything and any other task that He's given us if we do not first understand that our first and foremost work is to obey the head? In fact, we could use an illustration of this if you would, look with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelation. I want us to notice one church here that truly understood what it meant to obey the head. Now, before we look at this, uh, let me uh, refresh your memory as to the, the context that we see here in Revelation at chapters 2 and 3. Remember, Jesus is addressing His seven churches of Asia through the pen of John. And we see here that Jesus is either correcting His churches or encouraging them to continue if they're faithful. 
But we see here different categories, if you will, of the kind of churches that were represented here in Asia. There were some churches that Jesus had nothing good to say about. There were many churches that Jesus had some things good to say and some things negative to say. There was one church in particular that was faithful, but they were told to continue to be faithful through their tribulation. We don't know if they were faithful or not uh, through the end of that. That was the church at Smyrna. And then there was also one church that was holy and completely faithful, and that was the church at Philadelphia. This was the only church that we can say without question that it was indeed faithful in all things. In fact, in this context, Jesus himself says that he loved this church, and he tells them why he loved them. The reason why he loved them is because they bore the marks of obedience. They were a faithful church. So, Look with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. I'd like us to read verses 8 through 10. And here we are going to see three things, the three marks of faithfulness that we see within this church here in Philadelphia. So, Revelation 3, starting in verse 8, the Bible says, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you, because you have kept my command to persevere. And so again, we see here within this context the three marks of faithfulness that Philadelphia bore within them. If you notice with me back to verse 8, the first thing he says about them is the fact that they kept his word. My friends, that is what we're talking about. That is the first and foremost work of the church, to obey the head in all things, to keep his word. That's the very first thing Jesus addressed here. That was where it all started. They kept his word. And that was why they were so faithful, because they understood the importance of keeping his word. Notice with me next, it says here in verse 8, it says that they have not denied my name. Now, this implies that this church had already gone through tribulation. You look back to Smyrna. The church of Smyrna was about to go through tribulation, and they were told to be faithful, but we don't know if they were through that tribulation. However, we see here that this church, who did not deny his name, they had gone through tribulation, meaning they already had opportunity to deny his name, but they didn't. They did not deny his name. And so not only did they keep his word when times were good, but they also kept his word when times were bad. They did not forsake him even when it was perhaps convenient to do so. Then we see here at the end of verse 9, And to know that I have loved you, verse 10, because you have kept my command to persevere. This was a church that continued. This was a church that continued faithfully. But again, it all started with the very beginning here. They kept his word. Not only when times were good, but also when times were bad. And whether times were good or times were bad, they continued. They continued to persevere. They kept his command to persevere. And so again, Jesus says he loves this church, and the reason why is because they bore the marks of faithfulness, because they obeyed the head in all things. That was what made them so accepted and approved by Christ himself. We too can be a faithful and approved and beloved church. But it all begins with understanding our role and our function. We must understand that we are the body and that we are subject to the head. Once we understand this, then we can fulfill all the other works that Christ has given his church to do. Consider with me number two. Another work of the church or function of the body is to seek new members for the body. In other words, to seek and save the lost. Now, we mentioned a moment ago how Christ is the head, and that headship implies authority. Look back with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. I want you to notice with me here what Jesus says with all the authority given to him. Once again, Matthew chapter 28. I'd like to read verses 18 and 19. Once again, Matthew 28, starting in verse 18. The Bible says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, 
All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So, what we see here is that Jesus, with all authority, he tells his disciples to go and make more disciples and to baptize them. Now, I want us to zone in on that word baptize here. When we consider our point once again, the work of the church is to seek new members for the body. How is this word baptism significant in relation to that? Well, baptism is how we get into the church, is it not? 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, the Bible says, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, which we've already proven earlier is indeed the church, the one true church of our Lord Jesus Christ, Ephesians chapter 4. And so, in essence, taking a step back here from Matthew 28, here is what we can draw from this passage here. In other words, when it comes to the work of the church, the head of the body who has all authority has commanded his body to go and seek new members for the body. This is the work that Christ has given his church. Now, this should emphasize, perhaps in our minds, the importance of the church. You know, many have said in ignorance in times past and will continue to say that they just want Jesus and nothing else. They could care less about what church they are a part of. But my friends, we have to understand that Jesus and his church are inseparable. You know, you look to uh, Romans chapter 7, we see there that we are married to Christ. The church is. Looking over to Ephesians chapter 5, we are the bride of Christ. You cannot separate Christ and his one church. They are inseparable. And so the church does matter and the body does matter because they compose and make up those who are saved, those who have obeyed the gospel. Look with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, Paul, of course, is writing to his Ephesian brethren here. And kind of in the middle of this context, in the middle of this chapter, we see here a truth about the church. Look with me here. Ephesians 3 and verse 6, notice with me what the Bible says. Paul writes, he says, "...that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ through the gospel." Now, why did we look to this passage? What, what is Paul saying here? Well, if you notice, the things that Paul says in this verse are all synonymous. In other words, uh, Paul says here that those in the body of Christ are the self-same heirs and partakers. If we're going to be heirs of what God has for His children, if we're going to be partakers of what God has provided for all of us, then we must be in the body as well. And so again, that should emphasize in our minds the importance of the church. If we want to simplify this even more, we can look to Acts chapter 2. Remember there in Acts chapter 2, uh, Peter preaches to the Jews, and many there were convicted. And when they asked what they must do to be saved, Peter responded, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. But he goes on to say what the power of being baptized does. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, the Bible says that the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. In other words, the church composes and makes up those who are His, those who are saved. If we're not a part of that one body of Jesus Christ, if we've never done what it takes to get into that body, then, my friends, we cannot consider ourselves saved people. And so, again, my point is that we cannot truly have Jesus, we cannot truly be saved if we're not a part of His one true church. And so this should emphasize in our minds the need the, uh, of the work to seek new members for the body. You know, we have to understand that uh, we are all members of this one body. But that body, even though it is one, has many members. I stand here before you, I have one body, but it's made up of different components. I have a head, I have arms, I have hands. And so it is with Christ and His body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12 says, For as the body is one, and has many members, so also is Christ. 
And that context there in 1 Corinthians 12 goes on to talk about the different components that make up the body of Christ. He too, like our physical bodies, has hands and eyes and a mouth and feet, etc. The list goes on. But the point is, our task, our work as His body is to seek new members for His body. I'd like to read to you the words of a hymn that we sing every now and then. It's written by John E. Hamilton, and it's called The World's Bible, a beautiful song. And I believe it emphasizes the need and work of the church to seek new members for his body. Let me read to you the first line of this hymn. It goes like this. Christ has no hands but our hand to do his work today. He has no feet but our feet to lead men in his way. He has no tongue but our tongues to tell men how he died. He has no help but our help to bring them to His side. I believe this hymn emphasizes the gigantic responsibility of the church to seek new members for the body, to seek and save the lost. Look with me in your Bibles to one last passage in reference to this point. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. I believe this passage here is a good complement, if you will, to the great commission that we find in Matthew chapter 28. This here again emphasizes our work as the body of Christ. Once again, Romans 10, verses 14 and 15, the Bible says, How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Again, my friends, we must seek new members for the body. This is our work. Notice with me number three. Another work of the body, another function of the church, if you will, is to seek, or excuse me, to keep the body healthy. To keep the body healthy. In other words, the work of the church is to keep the saved saved. And so, again, we are to keep the body healthy. That implies that the body can become unhealthy. You know, one way in which the body of Christ can become unhealthy, just like our physical bodies, is by eating the wrong things. Like, for instance, the bread of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Matthew chapter 16, verses 11 and 12. Of course, we read in that context, he's not talking about bread at all. He's talking about their doctrines, their teachings that are anti-Christ. We could also include in that the bad fruit of the false prophets. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. Again, Jesus was not talking about food at all. He was talking about their ways and their teachings and their doctrines. The ways of this world that have nothing to do with spiritual things. We could also include in that perhaps the like the dog returning to its vomit in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. A very uh, explicit image, but nonetheless he, he paints that picture because he's illustrating what it's like for Christians who have tasted the heavenly gift to go back to the world. That's like uh, the prodigal son spending time in the pig pen and then going to his father's house and then going back to the pig pen. It's disgusting. And he doesn't realize how disgusting it is. But again, it's like a dog returning to his vomit. And all these things we see here, they're all all, uh, inclusive of the, the food of unrighteousness, if you will. That's what these things are. They're referring to the ways of the world, the teachings of this world, the doctrines that this world has to offer us. And they offer us nothing of any spiritual value. Again, going back to Matthew chapter 7, the foolish man who built his house on the sand. That's what the world's philosophies are built on. Things that have no content, no substance. Unlike, however, the truth. Kind of reminds me of what we were looking at this morning in our Colossians class. Brother Nathan was teaching, and, you know, he emphasized the word truth in that class. And I started thinking about that. You know, I don't know of any other book that that claims to present the truth as much as the Bible does. Because it is truth. John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And so the world may present to us all kinds of different things, but there's only one thing that is the rock. There's only one thing that is unchanging, and that is God through his word. 
And so again, my friends, let us stay away from the food of unrighteousness. They will not make the body healthy whatsoever. They can cause us to be sick. These foods of unrighteousness can corrupt our insides. They can even poison us, even to death, if we continue to feed on them. And so that begs the question, what are we eating? What kind of appetite do we have? Do we have an appetite for the world? Or do we have an appetite for Christ? Because the truth is, only an appetite for Christ can keep us spiritually healthy. Only eating of spiritual food, only by eating of spiritual food, can we grow as we ought. Look with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. My friends, we're talking about the body of Christ as a whole. And I believe if any context emphasizes the need for the body of Christ to grow, it is what we find here in Ephesians chapter 4. My friends, the body of Christ was never meant to be dormant. The body of Christ was never meant to be stagnant. Just like our physical bodies, we were never meant to be children forever. We were always meant to grow up. And so it is with Christ's body. The body of Christ was never meant to be dormant or a child forever. It was always meant to grow. It was always meant to increase. And the Bible teaches that fact. Look with me in your Bibles to Ephesians 4. I'd like us to read together verses 11 through 16. Ephesians 4, starting in verse 11. Now, as we read through this, uh, keep in mind and be looking for uh, key words within this context that, that emphasize and indicate growth within the body. Again, Ephesians 4, verse 11, the Bible says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head." Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Again, my friends, the body was never meant to be dormant. It was never meant to be stagnant. As we see here, the church, the body of Christ, is always meant to grow. And again, you see here within this context, you know, uh, verse, uh, verse uh, 12 mentions equipping. Uh, it also mentions edifying. Verse 13 mentions, uh, really, verse 13 mentions our goal, if you will. This is God's goal for us as to how tall we are to grow to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Christ was a spiritual giant, if you will. Will we ever reach his height? No. Will we ever reach his spiritual maturity? No. But the point is, this is our goal. This is what we strive for, to reach that height. Uh, verse 14 mentions that we're not to be any longer children. He also mentions in verse 15 that we are to grow up. Verse 16, growth of the body. Again, the church was always meant to grow. In fact, uh, in this context, you look back to verse 11, which we've just read. He mentions there the apostles and the, the uh, prophets and the, the teachers and the, and the pastors, if you will. These are the way, if you will, in which the church is to be equipped, if you look to verse 12. They equip the church. Now, of course, this is the first century in which we find you know, spiritual gifts. Uh, back in the first century, there was no such thing as the entire written Word of God, at least not yet. It was in the process of being composed. But nonetheless... God revealed His will to His church, the same will we have today, through His apostles and, and prophets and teachers. But the same way in which they equipped the church is the same way that we're equipped today. It's by the Scriptures. Remember 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 17? The only way in which we are equipped for every good work is through the Scriptures. My friends, the Word of God is how they fed the church, and that's the same way in which we feed upon today to grow and to increase and to maintain our healthiness, if you will. That is our work, to keep the body healthy, to keep the saved saved. And it all goes back to the Word of God that can help us do that. Remember uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2? Peter's very clear, very straightforward as to what our spiritual food is. It is the Word of God. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow 
thereby. It is by God's word that we keep the body healthy. It is the word of God that keeps us alive and healthy and growing. It is our sustenance to keep us always within the will of our God. It's within the word of God that we find instructions from the head. Think about the body, the human body for for a moment. How do we receive messages from our brain, if you will? How do we know how to function and move? Well, the brain sends out signals and messages to the body. Well, so it is in Christ's church. Where do we receive the instructions from the head? It is through the message that He has sent us. This is how we maintain health within the body. This is how we keep the say saved and continue to grow as we ought. The church at Philadelphia understood that, and that's why they were so faithful, because they kept His word. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 8. And that is how we will be successful too. You know, as we read in Ephesians 5 and verse 27, Christ seeks to present His body, His church, as glorious. He seeks to present us as without spot or wrinkle and wholly without blemish. But my friends, He cannot do that if we feed upon the corrupt foods of unrighteousness that this world has to offer. It is only alone by the Word of God that we continue to grow and keep the body healthy as we ought. And we must continue to feed on it. You don't, as a child, feed on on food for, for one feeding and then you're done. And that's it. We must continue to feed on it to maintain our healthiness. Remember, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16, Paul writes to Timothy and he says, Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing so, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. The only way to save ourselves, my friends, is to continue in the doctrine. That is how we keep the saved saved. That is the work of the church, to continue in the faith. We could uh, perhaps conclude and summarize with the word, the famous words of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. The Bible says, Let us be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Well, that's what we've looked at this evening, the work that our Lord has given us, the work of the church, the work and function of the body. As we have noticed, this is the work of the church. As the body of Christ, we obey the head in all things. We keep His word. As the body, we seek new members for the body, seeking and saving the lost. And as the body, we aim to keep the body healthy, to keep the saved saved. If we do this, my friends, then we will save both ourselves and those who hear us. We do want to extend an invitation this evening. If there is any here within the body of Christ who has not been a faithful member of that body, we want to encourage you to be faithful as we ought, to obey the head in all things, because only by doing that will we be, will we be wise and built upon the rock, if you will. If there are any here tonight who have any need of that, please let it be known as we stand in just a moment. But if there are any here tonight who are not Christians, who have never united themselves with the body of Christ, who has never become a part of His church, which makes up the saved, Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, then we want to encourage you to do that tonight. We, of course, know the prerequisites for salvation. We must believe in Him. And we must, of course, repent of our sins, turn from our worldliness, and continue to live a righteous life. We must confess that Jesus is the Christ and hold fast to that confession by being baptized, immersed into Christ. And it is by that act that the Lord adds us to His church. And there we continue in faithfulness, just like the Church of Philadelphia. If there are any here tonight who have any need whatsoever, please let it be known as we stand and as we sing.